Thank you, everybody, for joining us for our latest edition of Community Broadband Action Network's Lunch and Learn series. Our topic today is municipal broadband financing update, and we're really fortunate to have Michael Maloney with DA Davidson uh, with us today. Michael and DA are uh, CBAN associate members, so we want to thank them for uh, participating in the discussion today. Uh, along with uh, myself, Curtis Dean, uh, Todd Kilkoff, also co-founder of CBAN, will be uh, joining the discussion today at Welton Brown with Michael. Um, we will not do a death by PowerPoint today, but uh, instead it's just going to be a conversation about the latest and greatest in uh, how municipal broadband projects are being financed. I uh, did want to go through a couple of uh, housekeeping items. First of all, I want to um, welcome and thank our CBAN associate members. These are the companies that are um, part of CBAN and pay dues that help support uh, the activities that we're doing. Uh, 2020 was an activity, almost activity free uh, year, uh, although we did a lot of virtual events, but we weren't able to do our CBAN summit and any other in-person networking events. We hope to be able to review that or resume that this year. So we're working really hard to um, get everybody, uh, our, our full uh, C-band COVID vaccine program is in effect. So hopefully by the time we get to late fall, uh, we'll be able to get everybody back in a room together and do our C-band summit. So thank you to all these C-band associate members who uh, are helping support us. Now we, do, we have people on, um, on the call today that are not C-band members, we would really love to see you join C-band. Our goal in 2021 is to grow the organization for all our member classifications. Uh, I mentioned the associate members. Now they're the only ones that pay dues to be C-band members. Uh, the other memberships are free. Um, in fact, our community memberships, we have I think 26 or 27 community members now. So. Those are our um, uh, members whose communities are exploring broadband or trying to solve or fill the gaps in their broadband services that they have now. Those can be towns, those can be counties, economic development agencies, et cetera. So uh, if that sounds like you and you're not a CBAN member, we'd sure welcome you to come on board and you can't beat the price. It's our 2021 special, free, free, free. Uh, provider membership is also free if you are a community-based broadband provider, whether that's a fiber provider or a coaxial cable provider still, or uh, even we have a couple of wireless internet service providers. Uh, we welcome you to be a provider member. Advocate membership is open to anybody who just wants to see better broadband get to more Americans, uh, whether you're a representing a city or part of a city organization or not. So we've got people from all over the country that are advocate members. So this is the link to join CBAN. Just go to our broadbandaction.com website uh, backslash join CBAN, or you can just go to the website and you'll see all this information on there. Um, so we'd sure love to have you on board. I'll stop that for now. We'll come back to that later. Tease uh, our next event, which is going to be coming up next month. Right now, though, it is my honor to uh, bring our guests onto the, the, the stage, so to speak, here. Uh, Michael Maloney is with DA Davidson, and Michael has been intimately involved in providing um, uh, financing uh, for a number of municipal projects, including a number of broadband projects. And uh, Todd Kilkoff, as I mentioned, Todd's our co-founder of CBAN. And um, we all have worked with Michael on efforts in various uh, uh, communities around uh, the state of Iowa. And so, Michael, thanks for uh, coming on board. Absolutely. Thank you guys for uh, for having me here today. And uh, as Curtis mentioned, uh, no death by PowerPoint today, but I, I hope we can have uh, an interactive discussion here. And uh, Todd and Curtis's uh, familiarity with some of the Iowa specific projects and beyond uh, and, and provide a little context for the CBIN members attending today. So, Speaking uh, of participation, I, uh, before we get into okay. anything, Michael, I just want to remind everybody, you can participate various ways. We have a chat window. You can click the chat icon on the bottom of your Zoom window, uh, and that will open up the chat sidebar, and you can type your question or um, uh, comment in there. There's a Q&A uh, icon on the bottom screen where you can uh, type a question in, and we'll address those as we go, and we certainly hope to hear lots of feedback and questions from you. There's also a raise hand icon. And when you do that, you tell us you wanna talk and then I can turn your mic on and you can ask a question live and in living color. So uh, so that's how we want you to provide your feedback today. So we encourage you to do so. Okay, Michael, 
Um, let's talk yeah. a little bit about um, the strange and unusual year that we had in 2020 <laughs> <laughs> for various yeah. and reasons. Uh, what kind of impact or effect or did it have any impact or effect on broadband projects? Yeah, let's uh, let's just go right into the, the the meat of the matter here. And 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 2020 is inescapable from from COVID-19. Uh, I think we've all dealt with that circumstance to varying levels, and obviously provided challenges both personally and professionally through throughout the country and, and the world. Um, my focus today is talking a little bit of the financial ramifications of that. Uh, specifically, I think one of the biggest pieces that played a role into financing projects last year. Uh, it is is really what the impact was on investors, and I mean that in two ways. One one part, a uh, major part of the CARES Act, uh, and then the recent federal legislation is the the PPP program, Paycheck Protection Program, and the burden that that put on bank investors primarily that would be typical players for providing financial assistance. Uh, while this didn't necessarily have an overlap specifically, what it did was it really took capacity, both in terms of manpower and as well as capital from these financial institutions. So that played a major role into some of the attention that we were able to have at various points in the year or just the ability to pay attention from the investor market. The second part that maybe some of you that have refinance your home mortgage or had any other type of personal finance or commercial finance endeavors know that interest rates are extremely low. And mm -hmm. while we've been ringing that bell for some time, 2020 and the current circumstances are a particularly unique experience, not just with absolutely low rate levels, but an extremely flat yield curve. And we think of that traditional yield curve shape with relatively higher interest rates for longer years than shorter years, not seeing that much of a difference. What that meant was there was an incredible amount of demand for financial products. So with that demand, it helped keep rates low. I think the other piece that really plays into the telecom space was what it did is we see the traditional flight to quality. High quality investments, high quality assets, where investors want to particularly minimize whatever risk and are willing to give up return, so lower interest rates for that security. So rather than necessarily seeing a, you know, tightening from all credit classes, we saw higher investment grade or, or uh, lower grade, um, uh, kind of higher rate, higher yield type paper, not get the same type of benefit from the low interest rate environment. And that was for two reasons. One, it was only so low that some of those investment rates can go. And secondly, uh, there just weren't a lot of players in the market willing to take on additional risks. So people had the pick of the litter. It was an extremely high issuance year for municipal bonds. And the financial sector definitely showed that in terms of choosiness for folks. So it was often a matter of getting attention more than anything in that space. Um, that being said, uh, you know, we did complete uh, five uh, telecommunications projects. Uh, several of which were in Iowa in 2020. And I think that perspective, Iowa versus nationally, is an important one for, for folks to think about. Um, folks that participated in C-Band and, and know some of this group are aware that in Iowa, we have a nearly two-decade track record of municipal broadband and successful scenarios. Uh, we've seen a proliferation in the last five, six years of these projects coming to light again for various reasons, but the track record in Iowa is there and there are models and templates to follow, assuming there is political will for these projects. The difference and what we've seen pick up is partly this is uh, speeding up because of COVID concerns, connectivity, people working remotely, people not traveling as much, Zoom, like we're doing today, has really put a fine point and focus on the need for broadband and fiber infrastructure nationally. And that means there's been more projects going around the country. This is, this is leading to a couple things. One, certain states have different laws. I think one of the next sessions to jump ahead on the, the slide you did kind of tease there, Curtis, is talking about some of the efforts to slow down or outright stop the types of municipal projects that we work on in other states. Um, so uh, absent from those with just an outright prohibition, there might be other strings attached. Iowa has some strings attached. 
Other states may have a lot of different frameworks to provide availability or credit support for broadband infrastructure. And we've seen that be leveraged. Uh, I think a, a, a really simple and obvious one would be a place like Colorado, where we see relatively large electric utilities on the municipal space that can address a broadband project without tremendous impact to their balance sheet. If you have a $100 million operation and you want to do a $30 million total project for, for putting fiber in, that's not something that uh, is particularly challenging for them to pursue if they want to do it. Um, you, you, you're you issuing electric revenue bonds that are A or AA rated. Those are particularly straightforward financing. The hurdles, political um, and, and, and kind of a will and getting everything lined up than from the financial standpoint. Uh, in places like Iowa and other states around the Midwest, there are often major hoops, if not outright hurdles for pursuing those type of financing options. But even in some of our neighboring states, places like Minnesota or uh, Michigan, uh, where we've done business, there are ways to legally enhance the type of projects we have with certain backstops of support. And investors have been comfortable having a little extra protection and understand and see these projects. Enough of them are proliferating. Enough of them have matured over the last decade and refinanced or extended their projects where they're swimming in the same pool for investors as we are in Iowa. And investors are able to ask, hey, I got this here on the project I did with you in Michigan. Can I get this in Iowa? And we start having a situation where instead of, oh, it's the Iowa template, it's, hey, I did this here and I liked it. So that's one of the balancing acts we have in finding a little bit more skin in the game for our municipal issuers here in Iowa. My last point before Curtis or Todd maybe chimes in on this is we've also seen at the state level certain levels of support um, and, and or, or on a regional basis. So we think about a few projects uh, that maybe got some more national attention in the, the bond market this year. Um, you know, Eastern Vermont has a consortium of communities uh, in rural areas with a above ground fiber system um, that's been built out. And it's got a 10 year track record. It got off to a slow start, but now financial credit. So that's out there competing for, for investors. Um, out in Washington State, NOAA-NET has been a mature system that the state's helped put together really a, a, a broad transport fiber system around the state for communities to connect. And then Utopia Fiber, which I think is something that the C-Band groups talked about a little bit before in Utah, uh, that's definitely matured now after going through some growing pains. They, they've reached cash, cash flow positive uh, and have been there for about a decade now and continue to add new communities and new investments to the tune of almost $50 million a year. Uh, these mature systems are a great framework for where we might be able to go in the future, but we're also being compared to those right now on a project-to-project -project basis. Interesting. So we're competing against projects all over the country in a way. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yep. Yep. And and uh, there's a there's a couple reasons for that. One, the specialized nature of of some of these unique financings, right? It doesn't fit necessarily cleanly into a municipal bucket. One, and two, the continued consolidation of financial institutions, right? So as you've seen, you know, regional institutions grow bigger. They're expanding their footprint out of state, whether that's throughout just the Midwest or even more broadly. Uh, there's folks that are having more exposure to more types of products, especially in this specialty finance range. So uh, that world becomes a little bit smaller, Curtis, exactly. So it sounds like a little bit of a mixed bag. On, on the one hand, um, we've got low interest rate environment right now, which is yay. You can borrow money, spend a lot yep. less money on interest and do a project. But on the other hand, you've got more competition for the dollars that are out there, not only with other broadband projects, but with all these other things going on That's in right. the economy right now. That's right. So kind of start off with sort of that. Here's some of the challenge approaches. I think that was uh, important to highlight that's out there. Um, but I do want to kind of come back on the other side about how these are getting done, what has been successful, and maybe looking forward to 2021, what other alternatives may be out there and, and where those successes have come from. So I think the, the, the big thing that goes hand in hand is uh, because of poor inflation in these projects, not just within the state, but nationally, um, people are more aware of it. So investors now, we're, we're, we've worked on a lot of education and it doesn't mean we're not starting from scratch from time to time, but we're having these comparisons to, like I said, I'm gonna keep 
jumping into that well, the project I did with you in Michigan. Well, right. it means they have context for what fiber broadband is on a municipal way. We're not off on an island somewhere. We're not this totally unique, unforeseen thing. We still get that feedback on a maybe a, a smaller financial institution, local bank type level. But in terms of those specially financed and, and more traditional type investors, um, we're not trying to explain what the internet is anymore. Um, I mean, that's a little bit tongue in cheek, but now they're able to point to these other scenarios and at least understand what they think is an acceptable project to leverage, what they think are appropriate metrics to follow. So because of some of the challenges in 2020, I think we learned a lot too throughout the year in terms of what that investor feedback can be and, and what good processes are to help um, align with those types of projects. So um, as simple as, hey, we want enough enhancement or credit support that we can feel comfortable for X many years, or we want X percentage of local participation, some local skin in the game, either from mm -hmm. other municipal jurisdictions or local financial institutions. Those are some of the hooks that have become really important for folks who want to make sure what they have when they're investing matches up with other pieces of their portfolio. Good. Todd, I see you um, unmuted yourself. I'm assuming that means you wanted to talk. <laughs> yeah, I thought that, um, that it's not like that, but on that, that competition piece is, you know, you just have to, some communities have to understand that there's a, the, if other people can enhance a little bit, the, that yep. because of the electric utility or, you know, however the, the ratios look, uh, there's, uh, that might be a bigger trend in, in 21 because of the competition yep. the you just have to uh, be aware uh, going into it. That's going to be part of it. And uh, also, you know, the idea of having revenue coming in and being able to build phasing into a project from the get go may become more important if more communities, uh, particularly larger ones, uh, are trying to take on a bigger chunk, you know, at a time, uh, being able to be able to pinpoint revenue sources uh, faster. Than, yep. than a whole community that has a brand identity already that has a 20% credit credit enhancement to it. Yep, yep. Um, and, and I think along those lines, a, a few scenarios that uh, maybe didn't get to the finish line in 2020, but got developed more fully, uh, we keep pushing on. Um, and then we'll build off this with some of the other uh, programs that are out there. But you know, seeing the potential for partnership opportunities and, and actually working from the with the legal folks and is something uh, for for Iowa communities to be able to partner in a protected situation, having that legal framework drafted, thought through, available. Um, those types of templates are really important so that you can get closer uh, to the finish line when you start on some of those negotiations in the future. And I think there'll be a couple opportunities within the state communities that have been working on these types of projects for a while to at least build from that this year. That's a big one. Uh, the second piece is there are various pots of money through the USDA program. Many are just simply not really targeted for the municipal providers, but working with some of our bank lenders, we did go through the exercise a couple times in calendar year 2020 to go up the food chain, both with the state and DC to try to leverage these, these programs and, and, and got valuable feedback. And, and I think that's important to understand hey, here's where some of the limitations on these programs are if you want to impact these communities that I know Curtis and Todd will often refer to as the donut hole, right? We'll see mm -hmm. maybe some particularly rural parts of the state uh, have access to high-speed internet because of the private telephone companies. We'll see some of the more suburban and urban areas have some choice between some of the larger providers at a minimum uh, that may be able to provide that, that quality, but it's these county seat and county seat like towns that just often don't have the density or scale to make sense for the big players, but are probably too big a reach for the private partners without some incentives. So bridging that gap is going to be important. And I think thinking about the P3 opportunities with a specific framework for Iowa and thinking about, hey, we know what metrics we need to hit from USDA. Can we get there on a certain project or a portion of a project? That's feedback that we didn't have this time a, a year ago, and I, and I think that's something that should be should be considered and leveraged going forward. 
And that really fits into kind of what we've been talking about at our lunch and learn. So if you go back and think we talked to Jim Baller about his yep. best practices guide on public private partnerships, you know, I think we are able to pull those into financial terms now and try yep. to blend best practice thinking into that. Um, we had Cindy Axing on to talk about federal funding. Of course, if we would be remiss to not talk about money when we're talking about the potential for money, because it seems like the infrastructure bill is uh, is something that people are already starting to talk about agreeing on. Um, I know Curtis and I have already been contacted by uh, staff that they're wanting to push forward on broadband a little bit uh, already uh, with the new Congress. Uh, so. You know, there are, and there's pieces of that that were already in the uh, stimulus bill for low income support that could help on the uh, immediate take rate side. Absolutely. Yep. yep. And, and I think there's a couple more hits on the state and federal side um, that, that are worth, uh, worth commenting on. You know, num number one, uh, some of the programs uh, that USDA offers had a consolidation uh, as they went into the new budget year for the federal government end of September, early October, still working through how that streamlining, which is really what it was categorized of that those processes may work and what red tape was ultimately removed and how that might fit into some of the learning experiences we had last year with the USDA. But that's at least continuing to evolve. It's not a it's not a box that's just been this is how it's going to be forever and ever. They're evolving over time. So that's important to keep an eye on. Uh, obviously, Curtis and Todd have had, had Cindy Axney on, and, and we know that legislation is, is out there with the federal government. I would also uh, just take some reference points that we've heard from market commentary over the last couple of weeks, really the last week or so since the results in the Georgia Senate races. It appears that there's a, a, a clear push for bonding on the municipal level for uh, infrastructure, that any infrastructure package coming from the federal government may have some of those parameters with it. If that wasn't already ringing your bells, let me make the point here that that sounds a heck of a lot like where we were 12 years ago in 2009 with a lot of the same potential players in the new administration. And by that, we're talking about the ARA funds, the Recover, uh, Reinvestment right. Recovery Act, that led to several tax exempt uh, or tax uh, reimbursable bond program. So um, if you're thinking about stimulus in the wake of the COVID economic fallout, that feels like a template that could be there. And as we've been advising some of our issuer clients, um, while you may not have access to those dollars today, preparing for shovel ready, which was the clear naming uh, for projects uh, in 2009, 2010, shovel ready projects by this fall, may not be a bad strategy if there are federal dollars or enhanced federal programs available. So something to keep in mind on that infrastructure piece. Um, the, the second piece here is, is really with the state with uh, Governor Reynolds last night in the state of the state coming out and talking about her push for $450 million of investment on broadband over the next five years from state dollars uh, with the expectation that that's a two to one multiplier. Um, uh, you know, the idea of having uh, 1.3 to 1.4 billion dollars of broadband infrastructure over the next five years around the state um, is an exciting proposition based on our population and scale here in Iowa that would put the state uh, towards the top of the pack if that's applied in a, in a really proactive manner. So um, I appreciate that that was advocacy from the governor's office, but if you take note of where you know legislatures and the lobbyist groups are on both sides of the aisle, uh, broadband infrastructure is in the top five of priorities for all parties this year. So um, fingers crossed that something comes from that. Even uh, shooting for $450 million, something less than that program would still make a real dent. And I think it's going to be to the benefit of those folks that are organized and ready to take advantage of those dollars in the near term. It's a we pretty impressive it. upgrade uh, proposed this year versus last year. I think $5 million was what was sought Correct. for the Iowa Broadband Grant Program. But again, we don't know exactly what that form, that $450 million over five years might take. Will it be grants? Right. Will it be loans? Will it be guarantees? Um, 
that legislation has not been written or if it has it hasn't been shown to anybody yet yeah right. yeah that's the key is uh also is it just to just go to a minimum 25 by three <laughs> or is this truly uh saying we're gonna try to you know try to fix some issues um it would be ironic you know um if we're still then become the under the definition of underserved be, through all this on the backside becomes reliability um, right yeah that's what we don't want and i think that everybody on c-band understands that that's the difference maker on this it's um yeah. that once you can get to the speed side of the issue and the latency side solved then reliability becomes something more harder to define and uh and it'll be interesting to see how policymakers want to uh attack that because that's really where a lot of the investment needs to be in is on the infrastructure for reliability yeah yeah and, other... and i think making sure those dollars are targeted you know yeah. um the allocations you know one you want to make sure they're deployed they're not sitting there but you want to make sure they're deployed in a way that is is going to have good return not necessarily from a, um, a dollars and cents standpoint but from a productivity and economic development standpoint so exactly right Todd. i think that's that's the key. That's what, you know, C-Band's definitely pushed for, and I hope that follows through, but let's see the bill. <laughs> exactly. Well, we can't really ignore the, in terms of the amount of dollars that the cap auctions are going to bring in, in terms of the amount of, even if it's fixed wireless infrastructure that people say they're going to yep. bring to the state to improve coverage. Um, yep. But it's, Curtis, maybe you have a better feel for that about what do you think is going on uh, at the the, are we thinking that the state dollars are saying wireless isn't going to be good enough, so we want to have this program before these build outs because we've got these two five year goals that all of a sudden federal federal money has already been awarded in a different yeah. Way. Well, I was yeah. I was heartened to read this morning that uh, there's a, a letter that has uh, been written by a pretty large group of uh, people in the U.S. House and Senate on both parties. Um, and that joint letter was sent to the FCC, encouraging them to pay special attention and due diligence to what projects are actually planning to do with that recent Rural Digital Opportunity Fund or RDOF. Because we all kind of rolled our eyes when we saw what some of those awards went to, even in, for example, the state of Iowa, where there were, you know, awards to very rural areas where the award recipient said they're going to provide uh, gigabit services, but there's no, there's no showing of how they're planning to do that. And so this letter that I just was looking at this morning is essentially saying FCC, you need to hold the feet to the fire of these awardees, and they need to prove to you they're going to be able to meet not only the, the, the gigabit goals that they've set in their application, but they're going to be able to deploy it in a timely manner. Um, you know, that kind of follow up, that kind of accountability has really been missing in a lot of these, uh, a lot of these uh, federal programs, uh, until at least until the CAF2 funding, where they actually have some performance metrics in there that providers are going to have to prove uh, that they receive that money. Yep. Yep. So Michael, if, if you had your wish list on a, on a small project that you know um, is going to be in a served market technically by FCC, what, do you, what type of things do you kind of scratch your head and say, if we only had this, then that local provider can get better capital sources or, or something? Yeah. Well, you know, um, if I get to wish on something, I, I think the, the, the primary piece and what we'd like to see more of not just in Iowa, but elsewhere is to really reframe the actual fiber system, the fiber in the ground uh, and really frame it as an information highway, uh, as essential infrastructure. That classification would be the biggest game changer we would see, not just within the state of Iowa, but nationally. And for, you know, kind of the translation, that means the city being able to do simple public property tax back bonding geo bonds like you would for a street considering the the street and that fiber infrastructure as essential what that does would ensure that we could have access to anyone within city limits for that infrastructure 
uh, without any type of cherry picking for where service access is available. Doing that in a citywide ubiquitous every premise type way really doesn't make sense from an ROI perspective for anyone other than a municipality because it has to, in theory, exist forever. That's my number one wish list, but I appreciate I'm likely dreaming. Um, the second piece that I would suggest to have is really think about how you can leverage those assets beyond just retail services. We are just now shifting because of investor education that we've worked on in kind of our off season over the last five or six years of having our investors understand that there is more beyond the classic triple play revenue streams. And I think there's some low hanging fruit out there with communities that want to do things like smart grid and smart cities for their public utilities, for their public works department, for their streets department, that can be a communication element early in a process when working with folks like you guys. Uh, I think the second part of that is leveraging any other providers, whether it's public or private on the electric or gas side, that want to ride fiber to be able to connect stranded assets. That's just low hanging fruit. And then the last piece, which I know, you know, is a focus for anyone in the communication space, is the future of 5G, which will need to be fiber fed. And I think we've been able to have un investors understand that. I think the investors are also educated enough to know that the 5G being marketed by the major cell phone providers on TV for you to buy your new Galaxy or iPhone is different than the 5G that we know, uh, uh, you know, from from understanding with talking with folks from CBAN. So. Um, that future of 5G um, with the ultra wideband technology needs to be fiber fed at, at towers that are nearly spaced. And if that's going to be part of the future sooner than later, any fiber deployment really needs to be thinking about that up front in terms of capacity. Sizing your pipe, your system to be able to handle not just the retail service you're thinking about now, but whatever opportunities come in the future is the key. The expense is all about labor not about materials. So dig once and do it right, I think is just the number one piece. And if possible, have those negotiations with potential 5G providers. You don't have to have everything figured out day one, but you should at least have a seat at the table when you start these discussions, because even a small portion of a revenue stream there, in addition to those triple play services, really can enhance the projections from our cash flow standpoint. It may have an impact on, on a design if you're doing a project too, because I, there was a a uh, project that that I talked to the manager here about um, uh, recently about uh, 5G and and they had to essentially turn down an opportunity to do a, to feed uh, a cell provider because their design did not have enough fiber in that area to give it to be able to you know sell dark fiber to that carrier and that's what that carrier insisted on having so um, that would have been the sort of thing that you know when that system was designed a few years ago. Um, if 5G had been more in people's radar screen at that time, they could have, you know, designed it to have that excess capacity. So certainly the communities that are out there now kicking around projects or designing projects should be thinking about that additional investment up front to give them that additional capacity, not only for just 5G, but for the things we haven't thought of that we'll be using fiber for in 10, 15, 30 years. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's exactly right. I guess from a kind of a financing and planning standpoint, the last piece on the wish list there, Todd, would just be um, phasing. And I mean that by really taking a methodical approach to doing your research early in the process at certain steps. Figure out if there's partner opportunities. Figure out if you want to do it yourself. Who are the players that are there? Is someone else coming in? I, I think the key is to not go too deep too fast uh, doesn't mean you don't pursue the opportunity with vigor. It just means there are different off ramps along the process. And I know you and Curtis uh, will often talk about, I think that's more important now than ever because things are changing so quickly. These are dynamic situations, not just with funding, but opportunities. So that's a piece of it. And, and I'd also apply that phasing to the financing standpoint. I, I think as we see larger communities continue to look at how do we get in as part of the game, um, what, what was once old is new again. So the idea of, hey, we're going to take uh, some smaller bites off um, and build out over time, um, 
you know, kind of broke way to let's do the whole project up front. Now the size of these projects, the cost of these projects, the technical aspect of these projects is growing to a point where we might not be able to get 100% of the funding up front. And that's okay. So how is it built out in a way that stays? And, and that's working with your consultants and engineers to be able to provide folks like me uh, a, a template that's actionable, marketable, and financeable. So keeping that in mind, so it's not a pivot point, but part of the planning up front is just going to save time and money for everybody. And, you know, private operators have been using that phasing philosophy all mm -hmm. along. Although, unfortunately, in yep. their cases, sometimes people are in phase infinity because they'll never get to them. Um, okay. But even some of the private overbuilders um, have done that, um, whether it be, yep. um, you know, bigger companies like, say, Metronet or smaller companies like MyFiber that is um, doing some overbuilds in the Des Moines metro where they said, OK, we're going to do this area of uh, Waukee and then we're going to do that area of Waukee. And they just kind of, you know, are try to cash flow as much of that as they go. Uh, it's always a tough decision to do that when you're a municipality. Yep. Because as a municipal leader, you have a you have a responsibility to all citizens, and you have to be the bad guy to look them in the face and say, "Sorry, your area won't be done for three years because we have to phase this," as opposed to your area is going to be somebody's going to be first, somebody's going to be last, but we're going to compress that timeline by doing it all as one big project. That's so right. That's, that's right. And I think I think we've been spoiled here in Iowa. We have. We've had a lot of a great track record of success. And we've had a lot of projects that have followed a template that worked really well. There has never been one size fits all approach. Um, whether those were the best fit or not for folks at the time was the circumstances of each project. And I think now that we build our toolbox of options, um, both from a operation standpoint and a financing standpoint, it's important to keep that open mind from day one as communities work to plan this. It, it's needed infrastructure. It's gotta happen. It's gotta happen sooner or later. And it should be results oriented instead of process oriented. Yeah. And you're going to have to get flexible and creative uh, in the process. Yeah, absolutely. You know, a absolutely. Outside the box a little bit. That's right. I think it's right. important that we know for the viewers, too, that there's really been two macroeconomic things that we have to pay attention to that drive some of this partnership uh, opportunities and also um, the value of maybe some of these partnerships is number one, taxable interest rates compared to munis yes. in the telecom field that really compressed, correct? So in other words, that, that's speculative exactly right. here and taxable isn't too far off. So that allows that's you right. to do things um, with a private partner. The, if that was steeper, becomes a different decision. That's yeah, right. And, and I, I almost want to just kind of reframe some of this. I think we get focused on the municipal utility aspect because it's been such a positive model throughout the state of Iowa. But I also think that we can't lose sight of those municipal utilities have been so strong. And, and our friends at IAMU would point this out on a regular basis. You know, municipal utilities are about economic development opportunities. They're, they're good drivers and catalysts for the community. So as we approach these telecommunications projects and putting fiber infrastructure in, um, it's not just about owning or operating ourselves. It's having some dictation of the economic development opportunity to Todd's point. So, yep. And on a good credit, you, you can still do that with tax bill that frees you up on some private use restrictions. Right. The, the, and that's, and, and that's, that's, that's right back to a you know, development agreement that a city or county might do on a regular basis. It's just a reframing of that for this purpose. Exactly. And the other thing that, that we've seen since COVID, I think, has been just the drop, you know, in the long-term bond yields to the point that the reserves you have to carry have a much steeper dead weight against the rates you're paying on a more speculative right. issue. But that that got out of whack a little bit more. So even though you, interest rates might be down, you're not earning as much on the reserves that are being asked to be put up. And that, that's that right. hurts when you have to borrow up front. So that's where a phasing where you don't have to borrow up front all the way may have some more economic advantages that it didn't have a year ago. That's right. Uh, there's some happy medium there between kind of finding your way to what your long-term kind of 20-year life cycle financing element is going to be versus what you do get to get off the ground from a startup experience. Uh, and again, you know, that's, that's a kind of traditional way of doing finance, whether in the commercial sector or how we've seen some of the original munis get off the ground here in Iowa 20 years ago. 
Um, we've been able to have our cake and eat it too here <laughs> uh, a little bit uh, between 2015 and 2020, but uh, there's going to be a balance between those uh, for future opportunities starting this year. Well, we've said it before that the easy projects have probably already been done. Um, and those were that first generation of uh, communities from Cedar Falls and Muscatine on down that, that had established electric utilities, had a strong uh, mission and purpose and built those networks and even then since then rebuilt those networks to fiber to the home. And so there are just not that many municipalities in Iowa left that haven't that are in that same position, but haven't taken action yet. So they're going to have to think outside the box as far as how they come up with these funds. That's, that's wanna... right. And yeah, go ahead, Michael. No, and I, I think that's thinking a little bit more about what we're seeing outside of Iowa right now, right? Is, is, is more communities, other states don't have the same municipal utility legacy that Iowa does um, with the, the, the type of communities that we've had for for decades or a century in a lot of places with those other utilities operating and they are looking at those. So how can we leverage our knowledge and experience of what's worked there and frame them up under state law? And I think that's where the most progress was made in 2020, even though that maybe not be at the forefront of folks' minds unless you're tuning in here today. What are, what are some examples of state um, rules that if they were here in Iowa would make that job a lot easier? Are there any yeah, you know, examples in particular? Yeah, yeah I, I think two are, are, are very clear and I, I don't know how realistic they are in the near term, but um, one, I'll go back to the Colorado example where you can have combined municipal utilities. Um, it's technically allowable under the state code, but just not really the model that we've had here in Iowa, um, which differentiates from places like Minnesota or Colorado that have right. had that as part of their history. So. We need to keep, um, you know, uh, the municipal utility separate and distinct from our other municipal utility elements, whether that's water, sewer, electric, or gas. Um, and I think that's, you know, uh, not necessarily something that's going to be addressed here in state. The second is going to be uh, the ability for support from other community funds. And, and this is where we're really limited in Iowa, uh, where you can provide interfund loan support but only from designated surplus with set repayment schedules. So mm -hmm. that's a, a limiting factor for communities to help um, ongoing support of uh, a municipal telecom endeavor, which is highly restricted here in Iowa. We definitely see other states where that's part of the puzzle um, where, you know, whether it's a city fund or another element can just get behind in case there's early year shortfalls. That obviously really enhances the credit proposition for other, for other communities outside of the state on an apples to apples basis. Now, my counter to that's always been, whether talking with issuers here and board members or investors uh, that are looking at us versus other states and saying, hey, remember that's also a backstop where folks don't need as good a planning if they know they've got something to fall back on from that yeah. standpoint. Here in Iowa, we really do a lot of extra work to make sure that we've put enough precautions in there and a very conservative approach to the early ramp up period because we need these to stand on their own. So yeah. a little bit of a double-edged sword there um, that was to our benefit here in, in the recent past. But again, as we see more and more projects, those apples to apples versus apples to oranges comparisons are important. So those are the two biggest factors that we see and they're applied in different ways. But um, um, there, there's other places in the tax code and we're looking at other states just being in the open up programs, uh, the nonprofit routes, the one thing I think the three of us have talked about previously mm -hmm. that we haven't addressed today. And I know there are some nonprofit uh, operators in other states with small, maybe kind of downtown or commercial district uh, enterprises only on systems that are evaluating the ability to go to a C3, 501C3 model to try to take advantage of some of the tax code to provide access. And um, I don't really think the tax law is all the way through yet, so it's nice to have a couple of guinea pigs that we're working with to understand, hey, is this a model that can get to the finish line? Um, and, and they've got good partners, uh, good projects, good, um, um, uh, good setups, good leadership to, to get there. So again, I'm optimistic. We continue to learn and evaluate, and it's going to bring a better menu of options for our, for our friends here in Iowa uh, as this continues to, to move forward. One of the things that has been chat, uh, chatted about recently is, at least here in Iowa, is the ability to use the Iowa Finance Authority um, in, in some way, shape, or form 
to back projects. Todd, yeah, I know we've had this conversation lately. Maybe you can kind of frame that up a little bit for this conversation. Yeah, I guess, uh, you know, the idea that you can pool into larger securities that are more liquid at the national level, um, the IFA can pool those securities and be a collector um, on a first lien right, uh, whether or not that gets beyond a revenue stream um, to create some enhancement or whether you use some state funds to backstop the losses to say, okay, you know, you might have a 5% default rate here. We don't know where it is, but at least you're able to pool across the securities and that helps with the liquidity make the make your real estate investment trust and others more likely to buy those bonds. Do you think that's got, I mean, there's state lawmakers that are talking about it now. Um, do you think that that's a way to add some liquidity to that backstop as local dollars or? Well, uh, outside the telecom space, we've obviously seen the state backs up be a really strong enhancement feature. Um, you know, I think a pretty easy one is to look around the upper Midwest with potential for, you know, school district bonds that are effectively insured or enhanced by the state pool. So there's no question that in reality, that would be a really strong option. I think the devil's as always in the details and we're not yet sure where the legislation may lead on what the state support here would be in Iowa. Um, I think one of the challenges is always when you create a new model, um, you don't have the template necessarily to work from. So if we think about the SRF loan pools here in Iowa that have the federal support for clean water and drinking water, uh, there, there's a clear way that that programs work and has proliferated over the last two decades. Um, you know, what you're talking about counts a little bit more similar to some of the housing type state level bond programs we see in Iowa, among other states. And you're right that that security position, a lean on the assets has always been a particularly powerful, powerful and compelling element to, to give some um, benefit back to the investors or security providers here with the state. How that tracks with the telecom utility and how you value those assets becomes the real challenge here, right? We, we know we need to make these happen. The value of those assets in the ground are, are, are really um, challenging because, you know, the labor is so much of the cost for installation mm -hmm. and the benefit is from the future cash flows over the next decades of time. So creating a situation where it's understood who would really be in the first position and how much usage you'd get out of that asset has been the real challenge in those programs. So um, connecting the dots there is definitely going to be a priority if this is something that's pursued. But the idea of valuing these assets that we know are so important, uh, definitely a challenge that's gone back through us uh, working with some of the federal programs over the last year as well. So um, no, I, I, I obviously in theory, those are, those are just great ways to put the state uh, moving in the right direction on, on getting this necessary infrastructure involved. But uh, we'll, we'll need to see, and, and hopefully uh, the guidance being received at the state is going to be useful for those purposes. That could be in one of those details that we don't know about from what the governor was uh, proposing in her state of, state of the state address last night. We'll remind Correct. everybody, if you have yep. questions, to chime in, either the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen or chat. Raise your hand if you want to talk to us and we can unmute you. But I do have a question here for uh, for the group. How can we properly address the issue a community has that does not have an electric utility available to it for assistance for cash flow and being able to afford the infrastructure? Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's the that's the the, the key consideration at this point, right? So we've obviously talked about, you know, obviously the partner model in terms of the P3, but I also would, would definitely talk about finding revenue streams that can be created upfront to help support that takeoff and, and not be just depending on future retail services. So we highlighted that a little bit with some of the community partners. We also talked a little bit about you know 5G or some of those contracts. But I think the other piece of that puzzle is whether it's a partnership or another model, figuring out how a potential phased approach may help to get that off the ground. Just minimize the overall exposure risk to the investor base could be the best answer to solving some of those problems. Um, I think the final point for, for any of those projects that don't have additional enhancement comes down to a political will question as well. 
Um, I, I appreciate the challenge of getting a supermajority vote by referendum, but there is a way to unlock my wish list that Todd had talked about, which is some support from you know the property tax backed essential nature for borrowing, which should provide the lowest cost interest rates to put in infrastructure. The key to unlock that is a 60% vote by referendum in Iowa. And I think, you know, if the political will were there, finding a way to have some equity gained by, you know, taxpayer dollars as first in is, is the key uh, to make this really easy, but not a politically favorable position. So um, just I think those are some of the, the items that need to be on the table. A mix and match of those can be an appropriate way to get those across the finish line. Hopefully that's useful as a response. Has there ever been an attempt to seek a change to the law to lower the referendum threshold for geo bonds? You know, I don't know that that's really gotten a serious consideration in, in, in recent periods with the legislation. I, I don't know how far back we need to look at that. Um, it's not just telecom where that's a consideration for either. Oh, absolutely. I think if you take a look around with referendums in the state of Iowa versus some of our neighboring communities. One, that balance of what's available with and without a vote changes from state to state. And two, I think you see the projects that pass here are really focused on schools and jails. And, right. you know, beyond that, um, it's the one-offs for community buildings like a new city hall, um, fire station, or a swimming pool. Uh, so it's really just a matter of exposure. Uh, and I don't think that the bond referendums in Iowa have been used in the same way that they've been used in other states. So it's just apples and oranges again. But uh, for us to fulfill what we need uh, from an infrastructure standpoint for the rest of the century that that needs to be an option that's on the table and people should be should be thinking about it um if i'm not going to be tooting that horn then um, i don't know who will so i want to make sure that was out there for people to know as part of the toolbox well i've i've always said that you know if 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 your community can pass a bond referendum for an aquatic center that serves only a small portion of the community but benefits the community as a whole you could say the same thing about a fiber optic network. It serve it may only serve a certain percentage of the community directly, but it benefits the whole community. So why is that a harder lift than an aquatic center? Or, you know, insert your insert your project here. I'm not anti-aquatic center by any means, but uh, <laughs> um, I guess if I had the choice between an uh, aquatic center with a nice curly slide and fiber to my house, I think I'd have a pretty easy choice. But it hasn't been attempted a whole lot either because of that fear of the political and knowing that that then draws the T word and the T word brings in comp uh, entities like the Iowa TP Alliance and others that are uh, always on the outlook as watchdogs for uh, taxes supporting anything. So uh, any other questions from our group, just uh, chime in here again, you can raise your hand, you can use the chat function or the Q&A function. Uh, we wanna make sure you have a chance to answer, ask any questions here in the next couple of minutes before we wrap up. If we don't see any other questions, we'll go ahead and wrap up a bit early. But um, oh, while they're all thinking, uh, Todd or Michael, any other last thoughts? I thought it was interesting what Michael brought up about investors um, saying that there would be some sort of jeopardy problem over the long run if things are just not financially feasible or more beneficial uh, get embedded in the public policy. And I think that's a really good point. Uh, you don't want the worst projects, but yet people are starting to say the, the intangible benefits of broadband in rural areas where it's very expensive um, it, um, have to be measured in or, uh, so that's, that's really probably the policy balance there uh, to say you don't want purely bad projects after you have to enough review to say that they're good enough over the next 20 to 30 years, um, as we've seen project payback stretch from initially seven years, then to 12, then to 18, getting into 25, even with lower interest rates, uh, but it's getting hard to do. So yeah. It's just something I think yeah. everybody has to remember it's, it's a process to go through. Yeah, and, and I think your scale matters, not to dwell on your pool consideration there, Todd, but mm -hmm. I think it's all about risk exposure. And when we do pool, by definition, the point there is to spread the risk over a broader area. So 
I think from an economic development standpoint with broadband, we're, we're truly talking about what that does for GD multipliers, GDP multipliers within a community. Mm-hmm. Well, if we've got that at a county seat or smaller type community, that exposure and the ben- mix of benefit there really falls just on the investors in that localized loan. Um, and, and how much of a multiplier effect can we have? If we talk about the statewide investments, especially you know the really favorable feedback that the governor had last night, and you're talking about statewide and significant investment, the multiplier effect and the scale of that and kind of the rising tide raising all boats, that element can be tremendously powerful. So, um, you, you know, I, I'm not reinventing the wheel by saying scale matters, but I think that's a, a true piece of this. And if we're looking for long-term solutions, scale is going to be important to get things over the finish line. Great. Well, gentlemen, we don't have any more questions, so I think we'll uh, go ahead and wrap up, but I do want to preview our next C-Band Lunch and Learn next uh, next month on uh, February 10th at noon. We're going to shine the light on the anti-municipal broadband groups that have been out there for decades, uh, stoking the fires uh, in opposition to communities' rights and abilities to build their own networks. A um, couple of gentlemen have uh, encountered and uh, encountered these groups and countered their false claims, include Doug Dawson with CCG Consulting and Christopher Mitchell with the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. And they'll be uh, joining Todd and I, and uh, we'll have a really good discussion about uh, the tactics and where they're getting their money, a little bit about uh, these opposition efforts. So we invite you to join us next month. There's the registration link. uh, And uh, if you want to register right now for that, we'll of course be sending out uh, email reminders to our C-band list. So uh, with that, we'll go ahead and close the meeting. Thank you very much to Michael Maloney from DA Davidson uh, for joining us today. Todd Kilkoff, uh, C-Band co-founder, and on behalf of myself, Curtis Dean with C-Band, thank you very much, everyone, for participating, and we will see you at our next Lunch and Learn next month.